So, our last speaker for this session is Jacob Tomlinson, and he will be talking about distributed compute with uh, Dask, Amazon Web Service, and Kubernetes. Please. Great. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, so my colleague Alex helped me put this talk together, um, but he's pulled some of his content out into a lightning talk. So um, you'll enjoy that shortly. I might pull him down here if you ask me hard questions at the end. Um, but apart from that, I'm just going to go through and, and do this talk. So I'll just quickly introduce who we are. There's a few of us hanging around. Um, so we work for the Met Office, which is the UK's weather forecasting agency. We have a climate research center as well. We have around I don't know, these numbers change every time somebody tells me. We've got somewhere between 400 and 600 scientists in the building, right? They're all running different models, they're all running different sets of analysis. Um, my background is from the technology side, so supporting the systems that they use and, and, and building them um, bits of equipment to, to run their models on. We generate lots and lots of data. Um, it's kind of the bane of my life at the moment, dealing with the quantity of data that we're producing, we're kind of, we're on the order of producing around 200 terabytes a day, and that's going straight into archive. So we expect in the next five or 10 years, we're gonna be hitting around the exabyte mark. Um, and that's not including continuous upgrades to models and machines uh, that we're running. So I specifically work in a team called the Informatics Lab. Um, so we're a, kind of like an R&D team. Our goal is to research kind of technology and scientific practices that will inform what the Met Office is going to look like in five years in terms of kind of workflow and IT infrastructure and, and kind of what the, what the future holds um, for us. And a lot of that is based around data, right? That's kind of the, the main thing that's going on, going on with us. So kind of one of the things that um, is going to be addressed by the, the content of the, this talk um, is the problem that we have around kind of the scientific workflow. It's, it's something that's come up quite a few times um, within this conference already. But... I've just got a diagram here of kind of a standard typical workflow. So we've got our, our friendly scientist in the middle. He has an idea and forms some kind of hypothesis based on that idea. He'll then run a model on the big computers, um, whether that's going to be a full weather uh, simulation on the supercomputer or maybe pulling some data out of archive that's already been run. Um, it'll then be moving that data from the big machines onto something else, whether that's a compute cluster or a desktop or some, somewhere like that. And then we'll run some analysis probably in Python, hopefully. Um, and then from that, that Python that he's going to run, he'll end up producing some results. He'll look at those results. And then quite often, that will kind of feed back around the loop again. And he'll go around and around the loop a few times, kind of refining his hypothesis and kind of coming up with exactly what he wants to do until eventually an H paper pops out the other end. Okay, So that's the kind of workflow that, that we find that we're following. But it's a very slow workflow, particularly around moving things from one set of machines to another set of machines. And if the, if the second set of machines are slower or less capable, then that analysis is going to be much slower. Um, and and this, this whole lot is going to take a lot of time. And if we want to go around this cycle multiple times, this means that in between thinking and having ideas, there can be hours or days of just having to go and do some other task whilst you're waiting for something to run. And that kind of removes the flow from, from what you're doing. You know, If you have an idea and you run a simulation to test that idea, but you don't find the answer out until next week, you've, you're, you're not in that mental space anymore of having that idea in the first place. So obviously, you're going to iterate on top of that, but it's not going to be as efficient as being able to have an idea, run some code, wait 40 seconds, have a new idea, run some code, wait 40 seconds. Right? That's a much faster, much more iterable um, way of working and kind of should enable kind of better science in, in general. So a lot of the stuff that we do in our team is focusing on how how that can be possible, how we can build systems that enable that kind of practice. Um, and a lot of that is around how we efficiently schedule work on different machines and how we distribute compute across, across different, um, different systems that we have. And one of the really key parts of this is trying to be as absolutely lazy as possible. Try and do as little as possible. So if there's data somewhere, leave it where it is. Be lazy. Don't bother moving that data. And if you're going to do a load of com compute, Think about where that compute is going to get to at the end. Do you need to do all of that compute to get to your, your results? Are you kind of iterating over big data sets where you don't need all of that data? Are you having to pull lots of stuff from archive just to crop out sections of data because you can't extract just the bits that you want? Um, so one of the tools that we 
really like and that we've been using quite a lot, uh, especially within the research area, but also now within um, other parts of the organization, is Dask. So if you haven't heard of Dask, um, this talk is mainly going to be focusing on how to distribute Dask, but um, I'm going to go over some of the, the kind of fundamental ideas of Dask. So Dask is a library um, that you import. You can decorate your functions or use Dask directly, and it will take your code and it will convert it into a graph, right? And then it will take that graph and run it as efficiently as possible. So you can see that there's some example code up in the top. You can see the dictionary that it gets converted into, and you can see um, uh, like a, a drawn diagram of that, da uh, of that Dask graph. Um, this graph can then be optimized. So imagine that graph is way, way more complicated than that. And right at the very end, the last line of code is going to be to take a section out of an array. I only care about this one section that I'm going to plot. So why calculate the whole array if they're like um, not if they don't affect each other, if all the items in that array don't affect each other and they're kind of atomic elements, then we only need to calculate the ones that we want to plot. So let's be lazy with our compute graph and not bother running all the things that we don't need. So this is quite a nice that this follows on from um, the talk previously because Dask can use threading, it can use multiprocessing, and it can optimize on the machine that you're on. So you can run Dask on your laptop. If you've got four cores in your laptop, it will use the four cores in your laptop to distribute that graph. But Dask has also got a full distributed scheduler called distributed, and that allows you to run Dask across many, many machines and then spread your graph out across, across a large cluster. Dask has also got some different data structures that are built on top of pre-existing data structures that we all know and love. Um, so fortunately for us, quite a lot of our work um, is based around NumPy arrays. You know, we, we have a library that we use um, called Iris, and that is effectively NumPy arrays with extra metadata. Um, and so Dask can wrap that up into a Dask array, which just allows Dask to be more intelligent about how it distributes it. Um, and the same goes for pandas as well, so it's got data frames. And there's also Dask bags, which is just kind of like a mishmash collection of objects, but it also allows uh, Dask to kind of distribute that uh, a bit better. So Dask's great. Uh, we really enjoy using it. But one of the challenges that we face with using it is we have to run it somewhere. You know, we have a cluster in our data center next to our office. We have lots of machines in there, so we can install Dask on that. And that's great. But then we have a problem of making best use of that cluster. You know, that cluster is already running Slurm. It already knows how to pack different jobs in to that cluster. But um, Dask ideally wants to have the whole cluster for a very short amount of time. It wants to parallelize the job as much as possible to get it done really quickly. And then it could be the next person's turn, and then the next person's turn. So rather than having lots of kind of tall, thin jobs that run for a long time, all packed next to each other on a cluster, we want lots of kind of short, fat jobs that run sequentially on the cluster that use up the whole resource. So overall, you're still going to have lots of people waiting the same amount of time. Um, but whoever is lucky enough to submit their job first will get it done in a few seconds. Right? It's just a different way of, of packing the cluster. But it is. You know, an issue that we have to think about is how do we make best use of that? And, and quite often we end up with a cluster sat there not fully utilized. You know, there are spare cycles on it. There is free memory on that cluster. And we can't you know, necessarily pack work in because we don't know what people are going to do. So one of the really nice things um, that Dask has available is something called adaptive clusters. So when you build a Dask cluster, you install the scheduler somewhere, which is you know, a Python application and you have some workers installed on other machines, and they speak to the scheduler, the scheduler dishes out work. And that's great, but that's very static, right? You have your cluster, you have Dask installed on it. An adaptive cluster, you have just a scheduler, no workers. But the scheduler has some logic about how to get workers if it needs them. It can request a new worker, and it can release workers when it no longer uh, requires them. And that's really useful because that you know, allows us to run Dask on a big multi-tenant shared machine that's also running other workload, and Dask can kind of start stuff and stop stuff on there. But it becomes quite powerful for us when we mix that in with scalable compute systems, um, which I'll come on to in a second. I don't know, this is probably a terrible slide for you with this projector, um, but this is basically how you create an adaptive cluster in Dask. You create a Python script, which you import adaptive from distributed, you create a class, and that class has a scale up and a scale down method. Um, and then you have a Dask setup function floating about, which just attaches that class to the, um, the scheduler. And then when you run the Dask scheduler, you just pass this in as an argument. You pass this Python script into Dask, and it just wraps this along with the, with the, the scheduler. 
So you have this scale up and scale down method, and it's down to you to implement that in kind of however you want. There are a load of examples uh, kind of floating about on the internet, um, but it allows you to kind of fit in with whatever system you're running. So if you've got a Slurm scheduled machine, or if you're running Mesos, or if you're using AWS or Google Cloud Compute, um, you know, you write a Python uh, script which can request a worker. That worker has to have logic of how to join the scheduler, um, and then you also write uh, the function which releases that worker again when it's no longer required. So we've taken this and we put this together um, on AWS. So one of the things uh, in our team is we work almost entirely on AWS. We work as far away from the Met Office systems as possible. It allows us to really experiment with new software, cutting edge software. It kind of frees us from all the security implications of being on a secure network with a supercomputer on it. Um, it is a little bit limiting sometimes um, in terms of accessing those secure systems when we need to, um, but it allows us to explore kind of this flexible, flexible way of working. So here's a diagram of kind of what our, our test cluster looks like at the moment. So we have Amazon Web Services at the bottom. Each one of these yellow squares is a, an, a machine on Amazon, an EC2 instance, that has Kubernetes installed. So Kubernetes, if um, you're not aware of it, is a container scheduling uh, an orchestration application has come out of a load of projects from Google. It's like one of the fastest moving open source projects at the moment. Um, and it has logic about running containers on clusters. So you just give it machines and it fits, uh, fits these containers into those machines. And then, so the way we've got things set up um, within our cluster is we have these servers, we have Kubernetes installed on them, and then we have a Dash scheduler running on top of that. And we've implemented that Python class, which can then request more containers from Kubernetes. So when Dask gets given some work, it knows that it needs some workers. So it says to Kubernetes, can I have some containers? Kubernetes will then start those worker containers, which will connect back to the scheduler, and it will start running work. If it needs more, then it can start increasing those. And it will fit all of these into the spaces within the compute that we have in Amazon until that's full, right? We can saturate our cluster, completely fill it up with containers, at which point the Kubernetes autoscaling kicks in and says, Amazon, I need some more machines because I can't fulfill the requests that I'm getting anymore. So Amazon starts more machines uh, and it starts to scale out horizontally. And then when Dask finishes up its job, it then starts releasing the workers. I don't need these workers anymore. You can kill these containers. Um, and usually, you know, whatever you've run, you'll have some kind of answer at the end. So you need one worker hanging around just to remember what that answer is, but it can release all the other workers. So Kubernetes then gets a load of resource back and gets loads of stuff freed up. And then it can say to Amazon, oh, I don't need these machines anymore. I'm going to move these containers over here and then start removing these EC2 instances. And so it starts to scale back down again. And this is great because of the billing system within Amazon. So we pay per hour for these machines. So we can start off at the beginning of the day. We might have one machine maybe running on Amazon, which has got the scheduler and maybe my, my notebook running on there. And then as I come in in the morning and I log in and I start running some code, the scheduler will start asking for workers. The cluster will start scaling up. It will start running my work. But I'm getting these kind of interactive calls back really quickly. Then I might go for lunch, and it might start realizing I'm not doing much. So it might start scaling the cluster back down again. And I come back from lunch, start doing more work, and it start bringing it back up. I'll go home or off for the weekend, and the cluster will collapse back down to nothing. And it means that we're only paying for what we use. We haven't got this big cluster sat around in our data center any anymore doing nothing. We're just paying for the resource that we need from Amazon. So this slide, again, it's, it's not a great slide on this projector, but it kind of just shows me running um, a really, really simple task. So I think it just is, is cubing some numbers and then sleeping for a bit just to simulate something running. Um, but on the, on the right-hand side here, you've got this is the Dask kind of status um, board, and it's showing the jobs running. So I don't know if you, you can't really see the divisions on them, but all the little purple lines are individual functions being executed somewhere in the cluster. So when I first submit this job right down here, there's no workers, so it can't do anything. And so Dask, the Dash scheduler says, I need a worker. I just want one worker and I'm going to start doing this job. So we get this one worker, and it starts chugging through my functions, doing bits and pieces, um, and it realizes I can parallelize this. If I had more workers, I could do this faster. So it says, give me twice the number of workers that I've got now. So you get twice the number of workers, runs it for a little bit longer, goes, oh, I can do this in parallel. I need to scale up again. So it will double the numbers and double the numbers again. So you can kind of see this curve going, starting to go exponentially. Um, up to whatever your limits are within you know, AWS or Kubernetes or whatever you've configured. So um, this is just showing that it, it will scale up, and then it will run at this for a minute or two, and then scale back down again. So that's kind of a, a, quite a quick overview of, of what we've got running and, and how we're using this. Um, 
One thing I wanted to just promote quickly is that a lot of the stuff that we're doing with this, we're exploring in AWS, and to allow us to explore that, we've taken quite a lot of our data and moved it up into AWS, and we've made it open um, under the Amazon Open Data um, Initiative. So there's about 80 terabytes of raw model run data from the last few years. Um, there's one year of global at the moment and three years of UK specific. So if you're interested in that data, please go to data.informatics.lab.co.uk and have a look at the data we've got there. If you're interested in DAS clusters and kind of scaling up these kind of systems, please talk to us. We're more than happy to help you set up your own clusters so that you can start playing with our data. Um, and we kind of blog about all this kind of stuff and, and brain dump code into GitHub quite often. So. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions, please go ahead. Thank you so much for your interesting talk. Are there any questions? There. Uh, in the example where that you showed the um, the scheduler was the loan at the beginning and then you start one worker and then you say you realize you can start to parallelize. Is it, is it not possible to see how much parallelism you can uh, benefit from just by the initial scheduler state? So that's a good question. That, all that logic is wrapped up in Dask, which I haven't really dug into. I just, um, what we've implemented is Dask asks us for N workers and we provide it with N workers. How it does the, the logic of deciding how many workers it needs is kind of, you know, I'm sure it's something that could probably be improved within the Dask project, but it's kind of separate to, to what we've done, but yeah. Hey, um, how do you perform dependency management for, for the systems you, you need for the data analysis? So I assume if you're doing a lot of cutting edge work, you might need really new software. So let's say the, the latest commit from, I don't know, scikit-learn, whatever. How do you make sure that that gets deployed to your machines for the analysis? Yeah, so that's a good question. Dependency management is quite a, a tricky thing. One of the things that we found with using Dask as well, because it's implemented purely in Python, it does require that you have the same packages in your notebook and your Dask workers, and that it's consistent across all the workers, because it literally just pickles up your stuff and distributes it across, and then runs it and pickles it and passes it back again. Um, so a lot of where we're at at the moment is just kind of, we've got a base Docker image, which is kind of uh, installing a load of packages that we know we want and we know we like, and then our notebooks run in that same image and the workers run in that same image, so we can kind of be sure of the consistency across that. Um, other than that, sometimes we just have to send an initial Dask task, which is, you, you can run bash commands on the, you know, you, just, you use subprocess or whatever, so you run a bash command on the worker to then Conda install extra packages and just make sure they're consistent across. Um, one of the things we're really thinking about at the moment that we're totally undecided about is whether we should have shared clusters or per user clusters. Um, the adaptive stuff lends itself quite nicely to a per user cluster because everybody could get a scheduler that's not taking up any resource and then as they start running work, everybody's clusters are kind of competing for resource on the big machine. But then that would allow every user to manage their own dependencies within their own cluster. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Thank you so much. Okay.